biggest turd, biggest failure Yamaha has ever had. What's up everybody, welcome back to the garage. I am here today to show you my last build, a uh, 1974 Yamaha TX750A. And that A is important, I will tell you why as we get into the video. I'll try to give you guys a good rundown of this thing without blabbing too much, you know. I'll do my best, but I kind of want to tell you everything I did to it, you know. But would you just look at it? I mean, just look at it. Just look at that. A lot of you've probably never heard of this bike. And that's for good reason. They are fairly rare, but for all the wrong reasons. And I'll tell you some of those throughout this video. Do kind of a build bio, go over some things, maybe even give you a little history on the model and why it should be somewhat significant for Yamaha history. Let me take you back to the early 1900s. If you know anything about Yamaha, you would know they started out as a piano company. They were founded by Torakusu Yamaha, and he was a piano man. He Started off repairing pianos, transferred into creating his own pianos, and Yamaha became the biggest piano manufacturer in the world. They were very successful at it. Fast forward quite a bit, World War II unfortunately changed the entire landscape of Japan, and they really didn't have a need for pianos at the time. They had a need for cheap transportation. Yamaha Motor Company was founded by Jinichi, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Kawakama. Mr. Kawakama and his crew churned out the very first Yamaha motorcycle in 1955, the YA-1, a small twin bike, which had good success. And over the years, I mean, you know, they had success after success. They have a pretty illustrious history. Unfortunately, this is the big chink in the armor or the biggest failure of Yamaha's history, as some would call it. The TX750 was released in 1973 for a mere $1,554. Doesn't sound like a lot of money today. Back then, for a motorcycle, decent amount of money. So I could see why the people that spent their money on them and had nothing but problems and failures with them probably hate these things, and I understand why. But if you keep watching, you will understand, hopefully understand, why I do love this bike, why I think it deserved the probably couple thousand hours of work I put in this thing. And some of you out there that know these things or know of someone that had one might be saying, you are absolutely nuts for putting that much time, effort, money, whatever, into one of these bikes. But hopefully I can prove you wrong by the end of the video. An all new design for Yamaha. Everyone was transitioning into four cylinders in line fours, and Yamaha was kind of riding high off their success of the XS650, which, the, which was the predecessor to this. They had great success with that bike. It was a great parallel twin. They thought with new technology their engineers came up with, they could actually make the parallel twin a better engine, just as smooth as an inline four, and make as much power. That was their goal. And for the most part, they did achieve that. This is a 749cc, a 749cc parallel twin overhead cam engine. Unit construction, it actually does share the gearbox from an XS650, but as far as parts go, that is it. Uh, they didn't share anything else. Yamaha engineers came up with an all new design for this engine to make it run smooth. Like I said previously, that was their goal. They wanted this thing to run smooth like an inline four. They came up with a system called the Omniphase Balancer. It had a balance shaft to counteract the crankshaft vibration. That is pretty much an inherent problem with twins. And then they added a second balance shaft to counteract the vibration of the first balance shaft. Sounds strange, but it worked. Right, they also added a few little fixes to try to help smooth out the overall feel. They had a balanced tube between both uh, exhaust manifolds 
it was a 2-2 exhaust and it had a balancer tube on the front, which should help some, with some of that as well. It overall made pretty good power. It was in the mid, almost 70, 65-ish, I think it was, rated horsepower uh, overseas. Not here in the U.S., I believe they're slightly lower. And at first it was great. It ran smooth, cycle world, said it was a... I can't remember the quote, but basically said it ran as smooth as an inline four, and if you closed your eyes, you would think you were on a four. Yamaha basically succeeded in what they wanted to do. However, shortly after the release of the bike, they had plenty of engine failures. They were dealing with uh, seized main bearings, seized cams, overheating issues. All these things were starting to plague this engine. Yamaha actually issued a recall, which by all accounts was a first for a major manufacturer in the motorcycle industry to ever recall a motorcycle. These were it. And they had just catastrophic issues with the engine that were unforeseen, of course. And it really did hurt the reputation of these. Most people that remember these bikes, if they do know what they are, remember them as the, as the biggest turd, biggest failure Yamaha has ever had. It's arguable, but sure, I can see that. Um, they weren't great. So in 1974, for the 74 model year actually, Yamaha engineers came up with, I believe it was like 18 overall fixes for all the issues, which included uh, tensioner for the balance, balance, the tensioner for the balance shaft chains, which the original engine did not have. And they would stretch, get sloppy, make a bunch of noise, and actually make it run, run more rough than it probably would have without them. They addressed that. They added an oil cooler to help with the overheating issues. They added a sump extension, even though this is a dry sump. They added what they call the sump extension to the lower pan to get that main oil away from the counter shaft weights, which was frothing the oil up, causing oiling issues. That was solved. For the most part, those were the major fixes that that made this thing turn around. And it actually was a decent bike after that, and that would be the Model A. That's why that's important. This bike had all the fixes. And I'm unsure why this one was parked with roughly 9,000 miles on it. No clue. It was given to me from a friend, and it was a project started by a friend of his that was never finished. This thing kind of bounced around a bit, sat outside, had some bird crap on it. It was pretty roached when I got it. And I really didn't know what to do with it. I didn't even know what it was, to be honest. I had never heard of the bike. So I did some research, familiar, familiarized myself with it a bit, and I don't know what it is. I just became an instant fan of this thing. If you've ever seen one of these in stock form, they really were a pretty bike. Just as good looking as a, a CB750 or anything else out there, a KZ. They, in my opinion, they, they were beautiful bikes. And unfortunately, all those issues in 73 turned everybody off. They only sold roughly 900 worldwide in 74, this being one of them, and that was it. They were done. No one wanted them, they had a horrible reputation, and it basically just killed the TX750. Unfortunately, it just never came back. If you've ever seen one of these in stock form, you'd have an idea what they look like, your typical 1970s commuter bike, although it was kind of marketed more as a touring bike. But if you want to look and see what they looked like so you can have a, uh, a basis for a comparison, go ahead. I'll wait. Back? Okay. Pretty average bike, but very nice looking bike, as you can see. I totally transformed this one. And this was not my original idea for this bike. I was going to do like something like a flat tracker uh, just because the way it looked, it had some of those cues to me and it was a twin as well. But the more I looked at it, the more I started playing around with stuff, I really just wanted to do a road race style Kenny Roberts inspired bike. I've really always loved the 70s, 80s road race bikes. I just think they're beautiful machines. Of course, most of them were two-stroke. This is a four-stroke, but I did include some two-stroke styling cues, and a lot of this was inspired by Kenny Roberts' YZR500. Of course, 
there's changes. It's not anything near the same, but a lot of the, the design overall feel of the bike, that's what I was going for. And I think I succeeded. I'm pretty happy with it. Of course, you're your own worst critic. I can pick out flaws in this thing all day, but overall people seem to like it. I took it to Mama Tried Motorcycle Show in Milwaukee uh, about two weeks ago. If you've seen it there, you probably did see a big puddle of oil underneath. There's a reason why there's a drain pan under this thing if you've seen it in some of the B-roll, and there's a reason for that. On the trip up to Milwaukee, I had a strap brake on the trailer, uh, some really bad roads, road construction, all that typical Illinois stuff. The bike bounced up after the strap broke, came down on a center jack that I had underneath, and cracked the lower sump pan. <laughs> it leaked the whole show. It was not a good look, oil all under the bike, but you know, things happen. I'm just glad the thing didn't fall off the trailer or fall over or whatever. But I'm in the process of draining oil now, seeing what I need to do to rectify that issue, probably to weld it up. I did get it fired up before the show. It sounded cool. It sounded so cool. Oh, I can't wait to ride it. I haven't, unfortunately, have not got to ride this thing yet, just because of uh, weather, time constraints, things like that. A little bit more background. I started this build in 2018 as part of a Greasy Dozen run, which is something Old Bike Barn puts on. If you've never heard of Old Bike Barn, check them out. Uh, they do great stuff. They have a little organization they put together called the Greasy Dozen. And I was one of the lucky people for 2020. I started this in 2018 and it was real slow going, didn't have a lot of money or time. It kind of sat, bumped around, did some things here and there. Then when I got picked for the Greasy Dozen, they helped out a bit and Helped out a lot, actually. And it just gave me that spark I needed to get this thing done. So I had always wanted to try shaping aluminum. I had only done very, very little before this project. I had shaped some steel, kind of dipped my toes in the pond, if you will. And I really wanted to push my skills. I really wanted to learn. And this bike definitely helped me learn. As you can see, all the polished body work, it's not chrome, that is polished aluminum. It's all 3003 hand-shaped aluminum. I'll cue in a photo, it was a five by 10 sheet. Uh, kind of daunting task, looking at that bare sheet and hoping I could come up with the whole ideas that were in this crazy brain and get it to actually look good on the bike. It turned out pretty good, I think, from my first go at shaping a full custom fairing, tank, tail, fenders, all that stuff. But that's just on the surface. That was probably the majority of the work was all the shaping, all the polishing in here. Awful, but it turned out so cool. I'm happy with it. The entire project was done right here in this garage with exception of the seat. I'm not an upholster guy, I'm terrible. I had my buddy Dane, which if you wanna look him up on Instagram, it's please be seated. I'll put them down below. Amazing upholster guy. He always does me right on seats. He nailed it with the, the speed block design going through. Some of the grippy type vinyl on the edges of the leather. The grip, yellow stitch. I mean, he just, he nailed it perfectly. Other than that, I powder coated the frame at my buddy Mike Mueller's shop, Federal Moto in Chicago, because my small powder coat oven just wouldn't facilitate that. Other than that, this entire thing was done in this garage. And that's what I was kind of getting at in the last video is if you really want to learn how to shape metal, you really want to do some really cool stuff in your garage, you can do it. I think this is proof. It is proof that you can do whatever you have in your head with enough uh, gumption. That's, that's the right word. Uh, just, you know, motivation and will to to just get it out. If you're creative and there's things you really want to do, you just got to go for it. That's the only way. And I'm pretty, pretty happy I did this thing. Pushed my limits. It pushed me to the breaking point, literally, mentally breaking. And it physically, <laughs> it was just rough, but I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. There's times I hate this thing and there's other times I love it. It just depends on the day. So I'm going to take you around this thing, 
show you some of the little stuff I've done to it and the big stuff I've done to it you can mostly see but I'll try to cue you in on some of the little little mods here and there that I made that most people wouldn't even recognize unless you've seen a stock bike right next to it. So there's that oil I was talking about unfortunately but it's fixable. Hand shaped this tank, welded it, polished it, painted the graphics, everything right here in the garage. As you can see it's got a little quick release button right here makes it real easy to take off you can have the tank off in about two three minutes realistically and the reason for that is i converted this bike to a monoshock kind of difficult to see past all this stuff but there is a monoshock up there and it has linkage back here that goes down and adapted to the original twin shock placement. I did this basically modeled after Yamaha's Mono Shock Mono X suspension of the day that they used on motocross bikes and also their road race bikes. Mine is quite a bit different. Theirs was quite a longer shock. Pretty much went from here all the way up to the headstock. They're very difficult to find. Probably not as good technology as you can get today. So my idea was to use a Yamaha R6 shock from a, I believe it was a 2006. It is dampening adjustable and preload adjustable. And it actually works great for the weight of this bike. And the way it's placed actually worked out pretty well too. Also, this adjuster you see here is threaded. And you can turn that and actually change the angle of the shock, which it's not a ton of adjustment, but it's enough to actually make the spring rate feel different. You can change it up for different riders, what have you. And underneath the tank, which I can't show you at the moment, but I will clip in a quick photo, it is height adjustable. Underneath here, there's a threaded shaft that comes off the backbone. You can thread in or out, effectively changing the swing arm angle and raising or lowering the height of the bike. The front suspension, I reused the factory forks because they actually had some valving, some pretty high-tech valving for the mid-70s, uh, similar to what like a race tech valve does, just a simpler form. Got different like springs, changed to some Motul fork oil. They feel great, actually, as far as just feeling it on the ground. I haven't ridden it yet, of course. And I also wanted to upgrade the front brakes just to get a little bit more. These came with a single disc brake. Um, overseas, they did have an option for dual disc and it had the provisions already on the fork tubes for it. What I did here was I flip-flopped the fork tubes. These are actually from the left side. And the other side's from the right. I flipped them backwards so the mounting tabs were facing in the rear. I put some more modern, once again, R6 twin piston calipers on here. And I found some rotors that work, some floating style rotors, are actually Suzuki rotors, but they had the perfect bore size that I needed. The thickness, offset, I had to make some little spacers, machine them up to make them perfect, but they actually worked out really well. And I made these adjustable brackets to adapt the caliper on there. Turned out pretty neat, kind of looked like a 70s style road race bracket that the race teams would use. And if you're wondering about the wheels, they are the factory DID high shouldered wheels. This was actually the first road going bike to get these wheels. They were used previously on motocross bikes, but they decided to put them on a road bike. This was, excuse me, the first model to have them. I disassembled them, polished them, new spokes, new bearings, all that kind of stuff. I got some more modern rubber, Metzler Sportec Classics, which I think they look perfect. They're modern, but not too modern. They kind of fit the whole theme of the bike. This was a dry sound bike, like I mentioned previously. The oil tank used to be over on this side. I relocated it to under the tailpiece. It is not part of the tailpiece, it's underneath. And this is... Wow, who tightened that, Hercules? This is the oil tank. Sized pretty dang close to the original oil tank. 
and compensated for the extra lines for the oil cooler that I added. It's underneath that tail. Nice little aluminum tank. Holds the oil, some AN lines. Had to make some adapters for the feed and return. Bent up some stainless lines that went up to the front to the oil cooler. Reuse the factory Makuni Solex carbs, all rebuilt. Custom air box. As you can see, I did a two to two stainless exhaust, all TIG welded, and quite a complicated routing. Goes behind these heat shields here through the tailpiece, and I made these little two stroke style mufflers from scratch in here because I, I just couldn't find anything I liked that was the right size. These things sound pretty dang cool. Hopefully I can get it fired up soon and show you guys how it sounds. It sounds pretty awesome. I made this custom dash because I just don't like the wide open look a lot of fared race bikes have. Everything in there is just kind of visible and I wanted this thing to look a, bit, a little bit more classy. Made this little cowl dash panel, if you will. Houses uh, oil temp, speedometer, tachometer, and oil pressure gauges. All are functional. A Yamaha R1 master cylinder to take care of them big old boys there. I made my own foot controls. These are all made here in the garage. Pegs machined on my old lathe. The flat pieces I just do with a bandsaw and file. I do not have a milling machine, so... And that's why I gotta do it. Same with this little bracket here that holds the end lines. Brake strap. And back to one of the coolest parts of the bike, in my opinion, something I'm very proud of. I made a hydraulic drum. Now, if you've ever ridden a bike with rear sets and a drum with the linkage rod set up, you'll know what I'm talking about. You know, the factory bike has that giant sweeping brake rod, lever, sorry, that gives you plenty of leverage for that small linkage rod that goes back and actuates the drum. When you go to these shorter levers, of course, you lose that leverage. And I just never liked the way it felt. I always want to come up with a way. This is what I thought up. Once again, another Yamaha master cylinder from a sport bike. Custom line back to a clutch slave cylinder. This is actually from a Honda Civic that I welded some lugs to the hub and adapted it with a return spring and everything like that. And it works pretty dang good. Pretty proud of that. I don't know what it is, something little like that, but I love it. It's, it's so cool to me. Steering dampener, which don't know if it was necessary, but I thought it would look cool and I like the way they feel. There's so many custom brackets, all full custom wiring. You know, there's so many little things I made for this bike that I can't even remember to tell you all of them. I thought this bike deserved some uh, redemption. And I was contacted by Yamaha Motor USA after it was done. They seemed pretty happy with what I had done to it, which really made me feel good. Because there's not too many of these around. There are some overseas that, you know, they have a pretty good following in Australia. They just don't get modded very often. I don't see it as Yamaha's biggest failure. I see it as a lesson for them. Just like I try to look at everything, no failures, just lessons. I think it's a great bike. Time will tell how it rides. I think it's going to be great. It feels great. I love the riding position. It just, it gives me that, that race bike feel. And I can't wait to actually get this thing out on the road, tear some ass on it, and hopefully not crash it and ruin all my hard work. Uh, we will see about that, and I will definitely get some uh, footage of that when the time comes. But I really just wanted to give you guys an overview of the transformation of my 1974 Yamaha TX750A. I hope you enjoyed it. I know it's not super exciting, but this bike really was a huge turning point for me in my motorcycle building career. And if you want to learn more about it, uh, Google my name, Ron George, Yamaha TX750A. A few little things out there on the internet you can check out. 
look a, bit, a little bit more to the greasy dozen and find out more about that if you are interested. If you want to see this thing, the wife and I are traveling down to Austin, Texas for the hand built motorcycle show put on by Revival Cycles in Austin, Texas. It's a super fun show. I've been once. I'm excited to take the trip. Unfortunately, it's at a time when gas is probably the highest price I've ever seen in my life. Uh, we're going to go together. We're going to have a great time, make a vacation out of it. So if you plan on heading down to Austin for MotoGP at Coda, or if you are heading down for the show, if you see me around, say hi. If you want to check it out, I'll point out all the flaws to you. <laughs> you can see everything that I see. And I recommend coming to the show if you are somewhat near the Texas area. It is super fun. Really, really cool show. And I know you want to get the heck out of the house. Everyone's been bound up. Come down and have some fun. That's it for today's video. I hope you liked it. I try not to talk too much, but you know, sometimes I just, I'm a talker. You know, I can't help it. But I just really want to show you guys the bike. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give me that little thumbs up. Subscribe, tell your friends. We're going to have some more cool stuff coming out of here pretty soon. Yeah, maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> I hope so. But please, I really appreciate you guys sticking around, watching the video, and giving me the little bit of support I've got so far. I appreciate it. It's awesome. I'm going to continue to uh, keep doing it. See you guys later. Texas and see it. Hand built show, Austin, Texas, Revival Cycles. Come buy it. You want it. You know you want it. <laughs>